Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Abraham Rugo Moreu, and uh, I'm currently the country manager and the executive director of the International Budget Partnership Kenya. Uh, this is an organization that uh, <coughs> supports citizens and their different forms of organization to engage in the public finance space. Finance Bill 2023 has many problems. Um, it has, I would categorize the challenges with the Finance Bill into three. First of all is its timing, wrong timing. Why wrong timing? Because at a time when incomes of Kenyans have not been improving, at a time when uh, the economy is definitely difficult, at a time when uh, uh, even the world is in a sort of recession, it is wrong to imagine that the incomes of Kenyans are improving and therefore introduce more, more taxes. So, so, so I think there's a, there's a context in which it is playing. Um, I think the timing is not right for some of those proposals. By the way, I think it's important for us to say, including through the memorandum that we have prepared, there are things that we completely agree with, especially those that make the environment for doing business um, um, you know, um, uh, an engagement much, much, much better, even if they are. But the ones that are basically increasing uh, taxes are the ones where. So there's, there's, there's a context issue around it. But there's also a policy coherence challenge. And policy coherence challenge is that you don't see the interconnectivity of these different tax proposals and what exactly they, seem, they seek to achieve. As you might know, uh, we have had a discussion that we still don't have a national tax policy. What is a policy? What is a policy supposed? The main job of a policy is that policy creates predictability. Policy tells you that in the next couple of years, the government of Kenya is seeking to support local manufacturing. And therefore expect that there will be more conducive tax regime for whatever we are doing in terms of manufacturing locally. But there will be more punitive and tight measures of what we, of what we on anything that we produce locally that we are trying to import uh, from, 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 from outside. It also indicates that the, the growth trajectory of how much taxes we hope to raise over the year. So therefore, from a, from a business angle, you can do your tax planning. That's what a tax policy is supposed to, to do. Two, a tax policy and a policy framework, that's why I'm saying, is supposed to connect and see that the unit of taxation, which is the person, is still the same, the same person. It's the same person paying fuel, VAT on fuel. It's the same person paying payee, you know, uh, uh, income on, on their taxes. It's the same person uh, paying excise duty when making a, fo a, fo a phone call and a, and, a tra and a transaction. It's the same person contributing to the National Health Insurance Fund. Uh, it's the same. So that policy coherence, that when you do the total amount of taxation per month, this person uh, in cars, is it sustainable for that person to be able to operate? When you think about a business, if they are supposed, the business is supposed to pay a turnover tax, is supposed to remit certain taxes within 24 hours, is supposed to make all these contributions, even the ones that are being proposed for, poly, for, 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 for housing and what have you. Does that leave the business with a reason for continuity? Does it make economic sense? Because the businesses do not exist to finance government. They exist to make a profit, you know? Uh, and, and that has a ripple effect, both in terms of the perception of uh, investors, in terms of that's not necessarily a good place to go and, in, and, and, and invest, but also just in terms of employment creation. Because if the tax regime is very punitive, and does not see the connection that the same is the same unit. The unit of taxation is the same. That's where policy coherence uh, uh, comes in. But 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 thirdly, is almost what you see as a resolute not to listen to citizens. So on one hand, you have I think the highest number of submissions that have ever been made, perhaps after the constitutional making process. 1,400 memorandums. And those are the ones perhaps that made it. Perhaps some were, or some, some were not counted. Then on the other hand, 
you have leaders just thumping, saying it will be passed without even changing a comma or a full stop. That, I think, is perhaps might be the greatest undoing of the finance bill. I wish there was a mechanism in which there is a listening ear of saying, this is the context we are in. And we are not oblivious of the fact that government is in a tight spot financially. We are not oblivious that the government has actually signed certain agreements, even with the international players. But coming and saying, you elected us and therefore you must do, we, you must do what we want you to do. And we have the numbers. For me, I think that is a serious governance challenge for the finance bill. The constitutional framework, uh, when you read through the constitution, you see all the right language. But you have a political culture that has, that su supports and entertains and encourages and everything that has to do with giving positive reinforcement to this business politics relationship that is very unhealthy. A political culture that is very extractive and that believes that the way to wealth and money is public office. That's a political culture we've created. And uh, we're talking about political culture, I think it's important for us not to look like we're just talking about the politicians. Even the, vi the, 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 the language among the citizenry is whenever Mwashimiwa or the politician is around, extract from him because he's also going to extract from us. So it's, it's a political culture. So that when you have a chance, an interesting story I had from one of the politicians was uh, he was on the campaign trail and he met these guys and he explained to them, very pa he didn't win, uh, uh, but he explained to them very passionately about his vision, his convictions, his, 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 you know, his, the, the plans he has for them. They listened, they listened and at the end they said, guy, Whatever you're saying makes a lot of sense. But you see, that's in the future. We don't know whether it will happen. For now, sort us out. Right now, we don't have food. You sort us out. Whatever you will do, <laughs> when you get there, we have no control. <laughs> so it's a very extractive, extractive culture. And, they, and that then means that even campaign financing becomes very expensive. And it almost looks like the first order of business once in office is to recoup. We have had stories of governors spending the excesses of 500 million Kenya shillings in campaigns. On a good day, a governor will make about, let's say on a very, very good day, plus allowances, a million shillings as take home. In one year, they take 12 million shillings. In five years, they take 60 million shillings. But they spend how much? 500 million. Where are they supposed to recover the other 460? So it's a political culture problem. That's the point I'm trying to explain. And that's just an example. You know, and I've used, I think, on the average of how much governor spent. <laughs> the president must have spent much more. MPs are spending almost equivalent, I mean, somewhere around there. And you have six offices, all spending. So the citizens wait for campaigns, they cash out. Because they know the next five years, they are going to be extracted from. And any time even the member of parliament shows up in the villages, they try, they do their best to extract as much. <laughs> Because that's their only opportunity of interacting with public resources. Because they don't know whether the health, the health facility might not improve. The road might be carpeted, literally like carpeted. A uh, small thin layer of tarmac. After three, two, three years, it's completely back to the same potholes that were there. And they might never see this guy again until the next campaigning season. <laughs> So I think it's a political culture problem. And unless we fix the culture, uh, um, you know, it becomes, it becomes difficult mm -hmm. to attain the constitutional aspirations of any society.
think you need to create a disincentive for political offices, either by reducing the types of incomes and the salaries. So in one extent or another, it becomes undesirable from a point of making money. And therefore, you only attract those who want to provide public services and who wants to participate in the process of achieving public goods provision effectively. But you incent you when you incentivize that, you incentivize other aspects, for instance, private sector engagement. You make sure that there are opportunities uh, for making uh, incomes, whether through you know uh, household businesses or whether through employment, through different structures. In other words, you distribute the opportunities of income making as you disincentivize. But two, as you disincentivize from an income perspective, as it were, you also must give prestige to the office. And the prestige becomes serving the people and retiring honorably, having served the people. But thirdly, you must enforce rule of law so that anybody who is found with his hand in the teal faces the full consequences of the law. Right now, those three do not exist. You know, first of all, they still believe they are not paid well. <laughs> but it's because they, 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 they argue that they, they are people expect them to give them. And, and, and therefore they are taking, they are only taking what they distribute. But you cannot have a mechanism of distributing, redistributing public finances like that because first of all, not everybody accesses that redistribution. It's only those who have access to, to the power holders. How to go about it, I think is difficult. But it's something to consider. But even having said that it's a bit difficult, um, is uh, you see separation of powers is saying that the person who is checking the government of the day has goodwill in heart because he's represent he or she is representing the people. He has the direct mandate. So you already have the structures. What you are trying to deal with is how comes these structures are not working? Because the constitutional framework has, 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 uh, has made already that. In fact, has gone into perhaps more detail than necessary. Because governance in and of itself still requires some level of discretion. Because you cannot appoint somebody to office and still want to stand at the door every day to tell them what to do. What you do is that you create anarchy. Yet constitutions are supposed to create order <laughs> and structure in society. And therefore, the, 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 the push, the way I say it's a bit difficult, is that the push, the push of separating the powers, it has to be done by the very people who stand to, to lose by that separation of powers. What I mean is, the executive, for instance, and the legislator are both interested in the powers of the other. <laughs> Yet they are the ones who are supposed to enforce the separation of powers. So parliament uh, legislators want to implement, which is the role of the executive, and the executive wants to control oversight. <laughs> so each is interested in the responsibilities of the other. Uh, whereas one would argue that kind of a situation would uh, create a, a sort of checkmate so that each now knows that you know I, I, I hold you accountable. It seems to create a very unhealthy relationship, uh, almost a coalition of interests that is against the constitutional framework. Let me give you an example. So I am completely convinced that uh, if you removed the constituency development fund from anywhere association with, with the legislators, you would achieve a greater pa aspect of members of parliament knowing that unless they oversight the national government, public services will not be provided. Of course, there's an argument that then they will go and they will, they will be kneeling everywhere. 
So again, it takes us back to the culture question. Because really here you're saying is that you, you have the right language, you have the right mechanisms. But without rule of law, I don't think there's anything. Because there are countries where, for instance, you don't have as much detail of the law. But rule of law exists. And it's enforced. But of late, I have been thinking perhaps then this is to be taken back to the citizenry to say that uh, the citizens play a more active role. But that has limitations because all of us cannot check government. That's not our daily job. That's not our daily struggle. Not everybody wakes up wondering what is happening to public finances, say for poor souls like ourselves. Uh, but not everybody wakes up to do, to do that. Even as we get tired at times because the government is a huge structure. By the time you are finished with looking at one state corporation, there is drama happening on the other side. There is drama happening on the other side. So you only focus on certain. But I still think uh, uh, creating incentives by giving responsibility to the rightful structures perhaps might be the best way to achieve that you know, uh, separation of powers and full responsibility. And that the buck stops with somebody. Because right now the buck stops everywhere. It seems to stop everywhere. And everybody is pushing and kicking the can further down and pushing responsibility to somebody else.